am, a, this is Shrook's term, an astro brownie. Uh, Shrook came up with these new, there were brownies and then he needed a name for the rest of us, uh, an astro brownie. And I want to talk about the effect of eavesdropping on caching behavior in uh, gray squirrels. Many of you know, uh, yes, I, you, for a very long time, worked on fish. Uh, I have left the fishy world uh, and started to work on gray squirrels. Hence, uh, one of my collaborators, Tom Blone, who was a brownie postdoc, uh, and then a wonderful grad student, Courtney Harrington, and two uh, truly amazing undergrads who did a whole lot of the work here that I'm going to talk about uh, that were just um, really wonderful, all at St. Louis University. Um, before I get any farther, I do want to say a, a quick thank you to, I know there's going to be more accolades later, but a quick thank you to Felisa and everyone for just organizing this amazing event today. Um, I'm so thrilled and, and happy that I can be here, and it's such a wonderful event to honor these fabulous folks. Um, and just two more things. One is, uh, this is very preliminary data, and I think that's appropriate. Those of you who remember the Brown and Astro Brown uh, groups, that was the deal. You got to come and talk about your preliminary data, whatever it was. So this is um, a lot of it very... Um, uh, preliminary um, data. And then I think I'll put the author's acknowledgments, you know, at the beginning of a book, it always says, uh, okay, I, I learned lots, I got lots of information for people, but all the errors are mine, so uh, I'll just make sure the errors are mine. Mm -hmm. It's a map. What do I hit? <laughs> Thank you. So sorry. Not my forte. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, animal communication. And the historical approach to animal communication was that it was very much a dyadic approach. Um, they focused on a very single receiver um, and a basically a single, sig single signaler and a single receiver. The signal produced some sort of specialized signal, and we've seen some evidence of that today. And then the receiver behavior was in some way affected by um, that signal. And the signals could be all kinds of things. They could be behavioral, morphological, physiological, or some sort of combination of those. And then just here's my uh, humorous example of two dogs. And in case you can't, they're sniffing each other's butts. In case you can't read it in the back, I know it's a little hard. Uh, I'm sure we've met. No, don't tell me your name. Don't tell me. And so two dogs basically getting uh, chemical information about um, each other. And that's historically the way we've talked about this for a long time. Now, more recently, we've realized that lots of animals live within a single sort of signal and receiving range, and that, that we can basically get a lot of, they can get a lot of information, not just from the direct interactions, but also from basically um, observations of some sort of the interactions going on around them. And so we now know that things like eavesdroppers exist. And eavesdroppers, basically, um, these are individuals that can intercept communications so if you've got two individuals, a signal and a receiver, eavesdroppers are other individuals who can basically um, uh, intercept those signals. And they can get information about sex and status and locations of others. And that can result in some sort of behavioral modification. Then we also know, sort of contrasting to that, there's these things known as audience effects. And so that's when signalers actually go and modify their behavior based on the fact that there's potential eavesdropper present because of some uh, interaction there. And so these communication networks, which are certainly a different way of looking at things now, um, really provide us a really nice um, opportunity to explore effects on behavior. Sorry, the macro just doesn't look right. I'm getting it. Okay. Um, so one of the first, uh, this was looked at in um, some mate choice copying that was, you know, um, conspecifics. And then there was also some work looking at this in um, sort of predator-prey interactions. But Schmidt and Olsfield were really the first ones to look at this in any sort of kleptoparasitism system. And what they looked at was a food cache, cache pilfer system. So uh, they looked at these things, eastern gray squirrels, uh, and actually one of my other fabulous committee members here is Randy Thornhill, who has told me that uh, apparently squirrels are very good eating, and uh, we've already heard that too before, apparently squirrels are good eating. Uh, so what these squirrels do is they go around and when they find a cacheable object, uh, they will go, and as you can see this one is, they'll dig it and bury it somewhere. And then there are things known as cash pilferers. These are heterospecifics, in this case, a totally different taxa, um, in this case, blue jays, who will then go and rob, basically, those caches and take them and eat them. So the squirrels, they'll cache, basically, very selectively um, in the autumn and winter. They tend to cache hard foods, so uh, hard nuts or nuts with their shell intact. And that's because those won't rot. They don't tend to cache things like softer items, uh, such as, like, for instance, this peanut. 
that this J has because those tend to rot or nets without shells because those tend to rot. So instead, uh, they might, if they find those kinds of foods, items, eat them uh, immediately. Now, blue jays do also cache, so they're also cache, and they've also uh, very good at uh, sometimes pilfering squirrel caches. Uh, so what Schmidt and Oldfield wanted to know is, do squirrels eavesdrop on these jay vocalizations to learn about not only the presence, but also the location of what might be a potential cache robber? And they made a couple of predictions. They said, okay, if jays are nearby, squirrels should modify their behavior to basically in some way reduce the likelihood of pilfering. Um, and so what they said is, okay, if we offer squirrels cacheable nuts, so something hard, and something non-cacheable, so some sort of softer nut, we predict that squirrels should increase the use of non-cacheable nuts when squirrels are nearby. So they did an experiment, sort of a, a classic seed tray experiment. They had a couple seed trays, they filled them with pea gravel, uh, they put in one tray 15 hazelnuts with intact shells. Hazelnuts are uh, uh, sort of the creme de la creme for uh, squirrels as far as food. And with their intact shells, they cache very well uh, and don't rot. And then in the other tray, they put in 15 hazelnuts, but they had already taken the shells off. So these were much more likely to rot, so they considered these non-cacheable food items. And then they played vocalizations of either blue jays or American robins basically as control. Robins do not, uh, basically are not uh, cache pilferers, and they're insectivores, so they're not even um, eating seeds, basically. And they placed the, played those vocalizations from either 25 meters, what they called their mirror treatment, or 125 meters, far treatment from the trays. They put the trays out all day. At the end of the day, they uh, sifted through, recorded the number of seed items, basically, from each tray, and measured the giving up density. So here's what they found. These are the good of cacheables. Here are the controls, the robins. Uh, this is away and near for um, blue jay vocalizations. And you can see that the squirrels ate less cacheable nuts when the jay calls were basically played close by. So this was, they concluded, some evidence that squirrels do eavesdrop, and they, they can, jays can learn from the, or squirrels can learn from those jay vocalizations about the location, um, basically, of a pilfering threat. If the jays are close, they should reduce, basically, their caching behavior. But in this case, the way they looked at caching behavior was basically um, diet choice. What we wanted to do was sort of build on this by looking at not really diet choice, but what they might actually do in terms of caching behavior. And we're wondering sort of how might they actually modify their behavior, um, and not in terms of diet choice, but in terms of caching behavior, to actually basically reduce the possibility of pilfering. And so we made a couple of predictions. One is uh, they should re basically squirrels, if jays are nearby, they should reduce their caching behavior and instead consume more nuts. Um, and another possibility is they should move farther away from that potential cache robber when they're actually going to cache. And then the third prediction we made was that maybe they would increase their deception by making what they call false caches. Uh, squirrels are known often to, once they've got their nut in their mouth, they'll travel around, they'll dig, they'll actually go so far as to put their head down and almost even touch the ground, if they have the nut touch the ground, pat the ground and then leave, but not actually place the nut there. So those are what are known as false caches and, and um, said to be basically deceptive. So what we did was we tested these predictions in several sites around the St. Louis area, so this was a study, uh, St. Louis University's in the midtown of St. Louis, the city. Uh, and also has several humongous parks, so we have uh, lots of great sites for this. And during, um, I'll talk about two studies, one from the autumn and winter of 2001, and then one we've just finished from 2012. And what we did is we took food patches. So uh, we took five hazelnuts with intact shells, and we put them at the base of a tree. And then we had, for our vocalizations, we had a speaker and a CD, so we used wave file, wave files, not MP3s, because wave files or MP3s just compress the sound too much. Uh, placed those 15 meters from the food patch, and what we did then is if this is a tree, we placed it in one of the four cardinal uh, directions from the tree, randomly determined. Uh, we standardized the sound to 72 decibels. Uh, the files had, uh, the wave files had 30 seconds of calling, five minutes of silence, and that looped continuously until the squirrels had taken away all five of the um, nuts. And then we recorded the distance and the direction to cache, any sorts of false caching that they might have made, um, as well as uh, latency to caching. So here are uh, the results from that first experiment. You can see this is the proportion of food items, and these are the two treatments, robins and jays. The dark bars are whether or not they cached, and the light gray bars are whether or not they ate. 
And you can see from this, uh, they cached fewer nuts when the jay calls happened. So uh, they actually ate more nuts when jay calls happened. This is uh, looking at mean distance traveled, so how far they traveled to cache when robin calls and jay calls were um, played. And you can see they travel farther um, to cache when jay calls are played. And then finally, uh, this is basically looking at the directionality where they went. Um, so the proportion cached uh, robins and jays again. The dark bars are whether or not they cached toward the speaker, and the light gray bars are whether or not they cached away. And we were very general in this. Toward is truly toward the direction, say if that was where the speaker was, is actually toward it. Away is any of the other basically three cardinal directions, so it's sort of very broadly defined. And you can see in this case, they basically primarily clashed away from the speaker in both of these treatments. So that really suggests that yes, they do obviously appear to eavesdrop on bird vocalizations and modify their behavior um, in an appropriate manner. They reduce their caching behavior when this potential cache robber is there. Uh, we did, interestingly enough, did not find any effective vocalizations on false caching. We found in very few cases of this. Most of the cases um, you tend to read about in false caching are when conspecifics are around. So it may be a, a, fact that, uh, a possibility that they just don't do it when um, heterospecifics are around. But one of the things that sort of begged, and you saw the sort of, that they always uh, basically uh, cached away from the speakers, we're sort of wondering what it is as far as those J, uh, J vocalizations, um, how do they actually maybe assess um, the potential cache robber from those vocalizations? So we did a second experiment, um, sort of looking at whether or not is there some sort of general, this is sort of the first step of looking at whether or not they sort of recognize generalized J calls and treat those as potential pilferers. So we use the exact same methodology, but uh, use some species that will be near and dear to probably Dave's heart and anyone else who's been to the Chiric Palace. Uh, one is Stellar's Jays. So Stellar's Jays are only found in the western part of the U.S. Uh, basically, they are um, known cache robbers from conspecifics as well as heterospecifics like uh, chipmunks and have sort of a, a, a standard jay-like call. But they don't overlap in the range, basically, uh, where gray squirrels would be, our, our population certainly would be. And now there's elegant trogans, which if you've been to the Chiricahuas, hopefully you've been lucky enough to um, see and hear an elegant trogan. They're sort of rare visitors there. Southeast Arizona is their range, and then the, basically the west coast of Mexico. They are insectivores, or uh, basically frugivores, so again, they're not cash robbers. And uh, I confess, I, was, I forgot to put in the, I didn't get a chance to put in the sounds. They, and I will not imitate it, they have an odd sort of dog barking call. I mean, it's not like sort of anything else uh, you hear. So here's some results, these are the preliminary results that we just finished gathering up last month. Um, these are the two different types of uh, vocalization. These are trogans and uh, jays, and this is the average distance traveled. And you can see they traveled a little farther for the stellar jays than the trogans, but there's really nothing going on there. Um, this is the type of vocalization and whether they cached or ate. And you can see they cached more, basically, in this case, um, for both vocalizations. And again, similar to what we saw before, these are the types of vocalizations, trogans and jays. The darker blue are away, the lighter blue are toward. Uh, they moved away from both um, types of vocalizations. So it doesn't seem at this point that they are perceiving some sort of generalized J call, perhaps. Um, there's a number of possibilities might be going on. One might be that they actually have to learn vocalizations of cash robbers. No, I'm not sure about that. Uh, St. Louis is an urban area, and like many places, when the West Nile virus came through a few years ago, it hammered the Corvid populations badly. So there were no crows and no jays to be seen for many years um, at that place. So it's a possibility. Um, it also could be some sort of, uh, you know, the response could be innate from co-evolution with sympatric species. And there's a whole lot of work that we still want to do, sort of looking at the specifics of these different calls to try to understand what's going on. Um, so basically, yes, they can do, e squirrels do eavesdrop on bird vocalizations, and it does seem to allow them to um, assess localization of potential cache robbers, and they do then modify their behavior. Um, and we think that communication networks and this idea of heterospecific eavesdropping um, probably occurs in many systems and, and certainly further a further study, and we have uh, several other things planned to do. Um, and then the last thing I just want to say is a major thanks to um, Astrid uh, for being a great and patient mentor. I don't know about all of you, but once I finally got grad students, 
I had no clue, Astrid. I am so sorry. Uh, I had no clue if I was anything like some of the ones I've dealt with, but I, I just did a sincere apology. Uh, I had no idea what it was like. There should be a book about this. Um, also for her passioning, uh, demonstrating her passion um, for science, um, and also for showing me how to be think critically without being critical. Um, I'm very, very grateful for that, because that's something that I, I, I think is a great gift. Uh, <laughs> This one is for letting, I had a great dog, Buck, at the time, a fabulous one of my first Labrador Retrievers, and I was the field uh, assistant to, to go to the field course. And I asked Astrid if I could take Buck, and she said, oh yeah, sure. Where's he gonna sit? Oh, he'll just curl up in the front. Well, Astrid sat, like, right there, and Buck managed to sleep on her feet, and she would not move him for the entire way, for those of you who've done the trip down to Keno and back, you know, it's a very long way. So I have thanks for that. And then just one last thanks to Jim and Astrid. Um, as half of an academic couple, I also wanna thank them for um, really being an amazing model. Uh, they were one of the first sort of academic couples out there, especially in the same field. Uh, and they've been a great model to sort of see how academic couples work and can work. And as far as I know, we're still working on ours. Uh, so I wanna thank them also for that. And with that, I wanna thank everybody also in the uh, session today. So thank you all.